Hi, welcome back. I'm here and I have the pleasure of interviewing Pastor Tracy Venice. He's the pastor of the New Mission, Missionary yes, Baptist sir. Church, and he's also the founding visionary for CEG. My friend, welcome. My friend. Good Thank to see you. you, man. Thank you. Good, Good. to be here. CEG has been in existence now for about, what, eight and a half years? Yes. Okay. Um, there are a lot of people here in Cincinnati that really do not know how CEG actually got started. Why don't you give them a little history on CEG and how it came to be? CEG started um, one of the, from one of the street ministries that we used to do at New Mission. There was a lot of young men that I went to talk to and could not offer them any jobs. Mm. Okay. And they basically told us, you know, you don't have nothing to offer us. At the time, Jim Kleeman was working with one of our nonprofit or organizations. Um, and we was working with Fifth Third Bank, trying to get the bank and the churches in Madisonville together. All right, so you wanted an initiative between the two? Yes. Okay. Uh, we did a special project, Fifth Third. Then after we did their project, they never returned our phone call. Wow. <laughs> typical, typical. I told Jim, I said, Jim, you know, we need to make this bigger. Why not get more churches involved? Then let's go to Fifth Third. Okay. And Jim Clemens said, Tracy, there's an organization that's already doing it. He said, I know a man by the name of Jonathan Weather who has an organization that is networking with banks. I said, let's fly him in. Let's call all the other pastors in Cincinnati. Let's fly him in. Okay. Let's talk to him and let's see if we can make it work here. So he was not here in Cincinnati. Where, where was uh, uh, Jonathan Weaver? Jonathan's out of Maryland. Okay. okay. He's the founder of the original uh, Collective Empowerment Group. Okay. So you fly Jonathan into Cincinnati. What happens after that? If I remember right, there's about 28 to 30 pastors who showed up at the meeting. Uh, he gave us a background CEG. Uh, what it can do, what is happening in uh, Maryland. In fact, it was about seven of us uh, drove up to Maryland. They had a banquet, okay. and we were we was blown away. It was uh, senators was there and uh, high level, awesome. We saw the power that his church, these churches have by coming together on one accord. So you have this man, Dr. Jonathan Weaver, yes, sir. who now reaches out in Maryland, Prince George's County, yes, sir. and he pulls in other pastors yes. and other churches. Yes. If I remember correctly, Dr. Weaver had banks? Big banks. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Matter of fact, it was the uh, representatives of the state was there. Wow. They wrote a check for $50,000 if my uh, mind serves me right. Wait a minute. One pastor gets banks, churches involved, and because of that collective power, they now are bringing in state representatives yes, sir. to the tune of $50,000. So they almost underwrote the banquet. I would say so. Yes. Wow. Okay. In fact, the banquet hall was so big with so many people, um, it was paid for. All yes. right. So let's now transition, if we can, from that first meeting. You being the visionary, how have you seen CEG grow, change? What do you think some of the challenges are? After that meeting, the pastor said, yeah, we want to do this in Cincinnati. They voted me as the president. Okay. One of the initial problems that we had was having leverage with the banks. Mm -hmm. Um, it was slow at first, maybe seven, eight churches, uh, but not enough money, not enough people to impress the churches. One of the ideals that I had, I said, you know what, uh, I got some young guys off the streets who need jobs. Mm -hmm. Let's take the infrastructure of the church, bind it with the infrastructure of African American jobs, our, our companies, okay. and let's invest in ourselves. That was a new idea. No other uh, model, uh, collective empowerment model, has that uh, 
component to it. But I know Cincinnati. I know that Cincinnati needed that shot of adrenaline in the arm for our uh, black businesses. And so now we have those that from that marriage, we have a group that we now call them um, strategic partners. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and so the strategic partners with the churches collaborate so that it's a win-win situation. Yeah, the uh, businesses get, um, our, our congregations will want to go to them first. Okay. We encourage our congregates to, to patronize these businesses. Okay. The businesses give us a 10%, um, I guess you can say, 10% uh, off of the total price, <laughs> okay? Um, so it's a win-win situation. The businesses grow. Hopefully, my dream originally was that the businesses would grow to the extent that they would need to hire mm. young men and young ladies. Well, why not hire the young men and young ladies in our own neighborhood? That is really the, uh, the fulfillment of the vision, where the businesses are growing so fast that it creates job opportunities. And by doing that, the churches and the businesses together now begin to impact the destinies of really what goes on inside the African American community. That's economic empowerment. In a nutshell. In a nutshell. Okay. Let me ask you this, Pastor Venice. Um, you've been around this organization now for eight years. Uh, what do you see as some of the major challenges? Getting people on board, churches on board, businesses on board. I think we are doing well, mm -hmm. but we can do much better. We could do better. Uh, getting our congregations to to patronize the businesses. Uh, we're doing well, okay, but we can do better. We could do better. What would you say to pastors? Um, what would you say to pastors who are part of CEG? but find it very challenging to come out to support CEG events. For me, this is preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, how can I say that? Well, there was a time when the church, the African American church, was the center point of the community. Businesses, businesses started in the, in in the, the African American church. Everything started in the African American church. At some point, I guess, when uh, we became metro and we started moving about and can go everywhere, uh, the church lost its credibility mm. and its influence. The need is still there. If the church is the center point of people's money, mm. okay. economic empowerment, helping them live better, it gives us credibility and power again. Okay. Where they will listen to our message. So we have to reach them in such a way that when we open up our mouths to preach that there's something behind it. They see that we're not just speaking to them from a spiritual standpoint, but from a holistic standpoint, that we are affecting their everyday living. Okay. And we care. Let me turn the dial a little bit, okay. since I know you a little bit. What are you into now? What kind of things um, are going on for Tracy Venice now? You sure you want to ask that question? Yes, sir, I do. <laughs> um, I told you we were going to have fun. Okay. One of the major projects that I'm, I'm doing right now is I'm writing a marriage book. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that some of the fallout that is happening in our community because a family has fallen apart. Mm -hmm. The pattern that God has set up as far as family, when you break that pattern, it's going to be a, 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 a tidal wave mm. of consequences. That is part of what is happening. Fathers are not uh, being fathers, are not even in the home. Mm. So the young men and young ladies don't have a father to set that standard. Mm -hmm. It starts with calling us back to see God's intent, God's purpose 
of what he intended for marriage. We have lost the image. Mm -hmm. Talked to my son the other day. My son is 24 years old. This is what he told me. He said, Dad, most of my friends don't want to be married. They don't see nothing in it, no benefit. Why? Wow. He said, the picture is gone. I'm trying to take the principles of the Bible and repaint the, the picture. picture. You don't want what you can't see. Mm. If I told you that I'm making a dish and the dish is called uh, Gooba, doesn't sound good, does it? Nah. You can't desire it, can you? No. Because you never tasted it. Never tasted it. But once you smell it and taste it, you might want it. Because now you know what it looks like, you know what it tastes like. So if people really don't know what God's intent for marriage is, if they never seen the picture, if they never uh, saw the beauty of it, why would they want it? Mm. So the book is trying to create the desire again. Okay. So pray for me. All right. <laughs> Will do. One last question. Yes, sir. What's your favorite Bible verse? Wow. I don't know if I have a favorite Bible verse. But let's go back to the reading of the book. In the last book of the Old Testament, the last chapter of the last book, the last verse, Malachi says, unless I turn the father's hearts mm -hmm. back to back, the children, back. and the children's hearts back to the father, I'm going to have to come and curse the earth. The earth. That is a prophetic vision of Malachi looking, looking into the future. I believe looking into our day, and, and it's talking about the breakdown of the family mm -hmm. and where the children are not being raised, not being fathered, not being covered. And there's, a, there's such a consequence that God says, unless I turn that tide, I have no other choice but to send a curse. But I think that God is sending a wave of people mm -hmm. that is going to mentor young men and show them how to be men, mentor young ladies and show them how to be ladies, show them that they have value, show them that they are of worth and, of, and, and have significance, to call them the marriage back to what he intended. I believe that God is about ready to make a move. So return to the original intent turn to the original intent, God's intent. Right. He, he's the architect, <laughs> the author, the architect, the creator. Mm. He know what he, he intended, and he knows the blessings that are ended if we just follow the blueprint. There's a blueprint. Mm. When you follow the divine design, you get the divine blessings. You're a pretty smart man. I, had to hang, I, had, I get to hang out with you. <laughs> Cincinnati. You've just heard from my dear friend, but also a visionary uh, and a pastor, Pastor Tracy Venice, founding visionary and pres former president of the Collective Empowerment Group. My friend, God bless you. Thank you, man. Thank you for joy. this time. Thank you. All right. All right. Hi, welcome back. Um, Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing and speaking with Pastor Casey Smith. He is the pastor of Corinthian Baptist Church. It's located in Avondale. Pastor Smith, bless you, man. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well, bro. Um, I, I, there's a fact that I would like for our viewing audience to know. I, I don't think it's very often that people who go to high school together uh, get to see one another. I won't say how many years later, but uh, find themselves in the Lord's work in the same city and wind up in the same organization. Am I allowed to say Withrow High School? Yes, you are. Okay. Say it again. All right. Got my orange and black on. I, I see. I see. I was embarrassed. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. Listen, got a question for you. Um, for a viewing audience, um, they know that I'm uh, with the Collective Empowerment Group, but I'd like for you to tell our viewing audience how long you've been with CEG and what actually attracted you to CEG. This is really my, about my third year with the Collective Empowerment Group. Uh, presently, I serve as the chairperson for the membership committee. Okay. What attracted me to the group, well, let me tell you how, how, how I, 
I, I first learned about CEG. Okay. I was at a conference, a minister's conference in Hampton, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I get a call from Jim Klingman. And he wow. said, man, there's a person I want you to meet. And as I was talking with him, I was sitting, this pastor was walking up to me, Jonathan Weaver. Wow. And he said, Jim Klingman wants me to meet you. And I was on the phone with him. And so that's really when I first uh, became knowledgeable about CEG. And then I was invited to a breakfast. Okay. Loved the, the concept, the idea of churches working together to help one another and to help their membership. Came on board. Okay, great. Um, so you got to actually talk to and meet um, one of the founders uh, of the movement of CEG. Yeah, and I, and I forget how many years that was ago, but I still remember him walking up to me at, right, at Hampton. Right. Um, he, he, he's over 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, yeah, he's a big guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me, Casey, in your interaction with CEG, um, what stands out? What do you think is different about CEG than some of the other things that ministers and pastors have tried here in Cincinnati, Ohio? Well, again, as I said, I like the concept because, again, it's the church working together. It's the body of Christ trying mm -hmm. to help one another, and I, I believe that's a biblical concept. Uh, you had the Apostle Paul who was going around on missionary journeys, uh, not necessarily for his ministry, but to help other churches and to get churches to help one another. And so that's something that still must be done today. We, we kind of do our own little thing, build our own little kingdom, if you will, and we really don't work together as the body of Christ. And so I just like the idea of just working together, but also uh, it allows especially black churches, as you want to say predominantly black churches, to work together because many of our members are not doing well economically okay. and it allows us now to pull all of our resources and capital to together in order to become stronger because you know when we go to the bank is you know I go to the bank as Corinthian you go to the bank as First Baptist but it'd be better if Corinthian First Baptist went together uh, with other churches 20 other churches in order to now raise more capital so we become stronger when mm. we work together so we have more leverage oh, without collectively doubt. we mm -hmm. have more leverage mm -hmm. and people pay attention to mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. a little more all right um, you can't help but notice mm -hmm. that there is something going on in Avondale if you're driving 562 or what we call the Norwood lateral uh, would you like to share a little bit about what's going on on the property that uh, Corinthian has? Well, back uh, October 2010, uh, Corinthian, we purchased 30 acres that was known as the Showcase Cinema. Right. Now, back in the day, <laughs> that was the twin drive then. Right. You know, but then it became the Showcase Cinema. We purchased it uh, in order to relocate our church from Avondale to Bond Hill. Mm -hmm. Um, what really motivated us to do it, first we heard that the uh, 71 highway was coming through our property. We started looking for some other property. I had a deacon to come to me and say, Pastor, if you could do anything for Christ and you knew that you wouldn't fail, what would you do? Began mm -hmm. to think about it, put together a ministry plan, went out the very next day and uh, talked to the people there in Norwood. Then later we bought the property. Wow. Mm -hmm. God moves sometimes quicker than oh we're my ready God. for. And, and, and it, 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 it really motivated me to do what we call step out the boat. Okay. You know, because... It, it,